from Samuel 17. It's a funny, funny story. It's weird, isn't it? Um, of David and Goliath. What's going on? I stood up last week in a big congregation. It was great. It was a privilege. I was delighted to be there. I was encouraged to know what they thought. Well, I, I saw a few faces. Maybe I've got a clue what some of them were thinking. Because there's this big old church. I mean, you know, that church I was in last week was a big old place. Lovely people in it, but it was yowsh. And a lot of people all stacked up in seats all at the back and at the sides. and huge. And you get to the front and you look at it. Blimey, you know. It's not the help at all, yeah? It's full of people. And uh, I was being asked about what we do, <coughs> which was lovely. Concerned people want to pray for us, want to help us with what we're doing. They wanted to know about it, so I was being asked questions about what we're doing. And, and as I got halfway through, I could see people thinking, this guy's bonkers. <laughs> you, know, you get that sort of impression. So <laughs> it's really um, <laughs> well, that's what I got. I'm sure they were very calm about it. There was no, but I was talking about planting churches, little churches around the place, in in areas where it's you know it's been tried. <laughs> Frankly, it's been tried. It hasn't gone well for people. And uh, and then he said, "How many of you are there on a Sunday?" Oh, <laughs> oh I could just see a few just glaze over. The boy's mad. And there's this implicit assumption: you are too small or too weak. Or too unable to go to stand and pray for God to make him look good. Okay? That's the assumption, isn't it? How many of you are there? 100% quality. I mean, that's the relevant answer, isn't it? It's not a number. It's a death. You can sometimes be too big a church to plant a church. We can't speak. Too big a church to plant the church. Oh, we can organise this and we can organise that and we can devote resources and we can. But you can sell them pretty too small to do something that gives God glory. Because as Paul writes, when I am weak, then is he strong. So here's the story of David and Goliath. You know, it's about any. Sunday school, did we? But, but we do know what David and Goliath's about. Great story of the weak and the strong, isn't it? And God is glorified in taking the weak and the frail and the foolish and the things that are not. And this mad nutter has turned up in our big church on a Sunday night and he's talking about doing this and that, he must be off his trolley. Because if he picks that up and uses it, it just goes to show it's not that, it's not that fruit cake. I got a load of notes, I might not use as much, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Here we go. Introduction. <clears throat> Saul is king. The nation's coming together. But a lack of all out life on the line, dedication to God in his service, means that the task has not been completed. And it's that lack of willingness to just throw away whatever there is that you know makes you capable and makes you strong and rely on God that's getting them into the situation where they're not managing, they're not achieving, they're not getting there. And the Philistines have started pressing in from the left-hand side on the land that's been given over to the people of God already. Is that focused or not? Not quite, is it? So God has said already, I'm taking you in across the Red Sea and I'm giving you all this. <laughs> and the rest of good. Yeah, right, okay. Because there are small people. And because they said, yeah, right, come that, come that, come that, they haven't achieved it yet. Because they haven't factored God into their reckoning sufficiently and what he can do. The Philistines are these invading sea peoples. They come from the sea and they come in here and they've set up five big cities. And those five big cities have grown and grown on the basis of their trading empire, and now they haven't got enough grain fields. So they've got a food problem. So they start pushing to the east. Is that the east, the right-hand side? Yeah. They start pushing to the east, okay? And they're pushing into the fertile lands of Judah, where there are grain fields and stuff like that. And they're taking back the land. Now Israel's supposed to have gone in and taken the kingdom of the kingdom of God in this whole thing, taking back the Canaanites. But as they're doing that, a second front was opened up with these Philistines, and they're a real threat. And the people of God have made the mistake of getting onto the back foot. 
reckoning God out of the equation. Here lies the background to this passage. So verses 1 to 11, then we're talking about the state of Saul and his army. The state he's in. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoth in Judah. And they pitched camp at Ephes Damim between, the so between Sokoth and Azekah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites another hill, <coughs> the valley between them. And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, so a bit of a foreigner to all of them, came out of the Philistine camp. He's a freak. His height was six cubits and a span. It's just over three metres. He's a big guy. What's three metres look like? Three. So if he's lying down, he's from there to here. He's a big guy. Yeah. He's a bit of a nightmare, isn't he? You wouldn't want to meet him in the pub on a Friday night. If you down a few, he's getting a bit leery. And of course, he's getting a bit leery because he's coming out and he's saying, bronze helmet on his head, cold steel armour of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels, we'll get to that. And on his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. And his spear was like a weaver's rod and its point weighed 600 shekels. A lot. Shield bearer in front of him. And he comes to the front, big lad, and he stands up and he shouts to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you're the servant of Saul. Choose a man and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight, kill me, we'll become your slaves. If I overcome him, you become our slaves. And you become us and so on. The Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man, let us fight each other. Now, this is the important bit, that's why it's in red. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. No problem with any of this except that last bit. That last bit's not on. That's the beginning of the problem. Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. God has brought them out of Egypt. He's brought them through the Red Sea. He's dealt with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is one time. He's brought them 40 years through the desert and they've faced some problems and some difficulties there. He's brought them through all of that. He's brought them into the Promised Land. He's brought them to a situation where they've had victory upon victory. They've had Jericho. I mean, who would not have wanted to be at Jericho? Did you see that on, on the film last night? Did you? Anybody? Is anybody watching this? Worst of my time. It's me and Caleb in this story. That's it. Me and him. You know, we're in the same room. <laughs> Soaking it up. So... Yeah, last night, you know, Jericho, walk around seven days, don't say a word, seventh day, blow the trumpets, whoosh, shout all straight up, you know, and God has done amazing things. But one guy, okay, he's three metres high, but he comes out dressed in some fancy battle kit, and Saul and the Israelites are dismayed and terrified. The key text that explains this is not found in this chapter, it's found in the chapter just before it, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. It says, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. That's the beginning of the problem. Saul hasn't been prepared to live all out for God, and God said, right, you're on your own. If you're not ready to live your life leaning on me, then you're not good enough for the job, and you're going to find out. You're going to find out you're not up to the task if you're not leaning on me. I'm going to show you. God, no. So what's the, bit, what's the response to that then? There's, there's a terrible thing that comes up. A terrible uh, realization dawns upon Saul and his people. What's the response? Are they going to have days of prayer? Are they going to have days of fasting? Are they going to have days of family or national repentance? No. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 15, Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. Can play the liar. It's like a fancy little heart. He'll play when the evil spirit from God comes on you. You'll feel a bit better. Is that a solution? So Saul said to his attendants, being the mother he'd become, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. Let's find someone to soothe Saul in his sin. Then he'll feel better. We want to be compassionate, we want to be kind, don't we? 
It's soothing a man in his sin. It is always the worst possible thing to soothe a man. Look how that man in his sin, and that's what they did, and that's what they did yesterday. There, there, put a stick in plaster. And I'm hearing the first man's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. What a disgrace to their God. What a disgrace to their simple manhood and humanity. The outcome was that the Lord stayed departed from Saul. They were supposed to be the people whose God was the Lord. And in, in the past, they'd, they'd struck fear in all those people who stood up to them and opposed their God and his plans and purposes because their power was so immense. Not because of their number, not because they were the most numerous people, but because their God was with them. And God is gone because of their sin. And then the response is, oh, well, let's, let's make ourselves feel better about that. Play with some heart. And now they find themselves unable to cope because they're looking for sticking plasters for a much bigger problem, which is much easier to solve for them. But they won't have the solution. Repentance and faith again. So the people of God are under a great deal of pressure from these Philistines. As I was saying just, just now, they're all down that left-hand side there, you see, and they're pushing across, looking for grain, looking for land they can feed their five cities. Here are the five cities of the Philistines. They lived in cities. They lived in Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashkelon, Gath and Ekron. And to feed those big concentrations of population, they're pushing into the fertile lands of Judah. What had been so impressive about Israel was that their God was for real, that he stepped into situations where they needed him to set up his earthly kingdom. But now... Out comes the challenge from pagan and paganism. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's the state they got into. Unable to cope, unable to meet the challenge. Because they turned from their God. Great deal of pressure. Conflict is going to step up. And it's going to step up at soccer in Judah. Now, the geography of the situation is this. Philistines gathered their forces for war, they assembled at Sokka, and they pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Sokka and Azekel, and Saul and the Israelites assembled, they camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up their battle lines, and the Philistines are on this hill, and the Israelites on that hill, and there's a valley in between them. A bit of a strategic position to describe, here's a picture of the situation there today, here's the valley of Elah, oh yes, no, here's the valley of Elah, okay, <coughs> Sokka and Judah's own, well it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Soccer and Judah's over here. Saul's camp is on this hill. Philistine's camp is on this hill here. Can you see this hill here? And there's the creek. David comes down, picks up five pebbles, and goes to meet Goliath in the valley of Elah. Excuse me. <coughs> that's the topography, that's the location. The villages that are involved are there in Israel today. And out comes Goliath, and he stands somewhere here where he can be heard, perhaps by that road they built through it. And he says, get out of here, send me a man. Are there any men out there? Who can, who can take him on? This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. And let us fight one another. There's nothing in Mesopotamian literature about uh, combat. One to one combat is a representative combat thing. This is the ancient era, this is Mesopotamia, this is the Bronze Age, you realise that? I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit um, down worth and gory because we did it with the Bronze Age tribal situation. It's a long time back. And they weren't, they used to just sort of, you know, everybody beat everybody up. They didn't have this sort of representative bring out the champion thing. That seems to have come from Europe, and of course the Philistines have come from the sea, you know, so they brought all these European ideas by the look of it. So out comes this guy, and he defies the armies of Israel, and the armies of Israel are standing there, shaking in their boots. Six-week standoff, according to verse 16. A six-week standoff. Where he comes out every day, and he taunts them. 
And he runs down their people and their king and their God. There's a spiritual thing going on. And yet Israel could find no one in their ranks for all manner of spiritual reasons, spiritual weaknesses, who is willing to honor God in contention against this first side. Can you see why they couldn't find anybody? Why did Jonathan, whose bravery had been conspicuous at Michmash in 1 Samuel 14, why didn't Jonathan stand out and take on the first fight? <clears throat> why didn't Abner, he's a big lad, he's a big hard lad, he's very experienced in battle, commander of the armies of Israel, why didn't he have a go? Why didn't he make some sort of effort to find a big brawny lad in the ranks somewhere to at least give Goliath some sort of challenge? Can you see why? Goliath, nine feet high, big bronze helmet like the gold one we've dug up from earth. Technology brought into Canaan by the Philistines. This chapter makes the first use of the word for that in the Hebrew language. It's a new technology, it's a new warfare technology. This helmet's a fantastic thing. Scale armour of bronze weighing 57 kilos. It's heavier than a pork pig. How about that? It's big, isn't it? Big old thing. Greaves to protect his legs, highly expensive. Probably he alone of the force there would have sported these bronze greaves in that bronze age. This was offensive weaponry, of, uh, defensive weaponry of the highest order. And then there's his offensive weaponry too, very impressive, javelin. Well, it says javelin in our translations. The Hebrew would have been more like a sword, like a, a flat curved blade, like a sickle, but the outer edge of the sickle is the one that's sharpened for cutting. It's quite an awful piece of wood. Spear. More like an iron pointed javelin, equipped as in a weaver's beam. What does that mean? Well, a weaver's beam has got a cord wrapped around the shaft. So it looks like this thing has got like, this cord on it to give extra distance and improve its piercing power by the rotation. Yeah? The whack, you throw it like that. See those throwing sticks, you know, with a cord on them? And in front of the guy walks his shield bearer, the hot, large, heavy, rectangular shield. You see that coming? This is bonkers. This guy is a walking armory. This guy is like, you know, a bit of, bit of the, the most advanced battlefield technology anybody's ever seen. And he is quite tall. He's a big lad. No one wants to come out to his challenge. So here comes my question again for you. Why does nobody want to? It's one thing for Goliath, the pagan defier of God, to be confident in the effectiveness of his equipment, in the effectiveness of his, of his ways and means, its ability to win the day. It is an utterly different thing for those whose faith should be in God to be confident of its effectiveness and its ability to win the day. Now, this is where faith comes into the equation. David's attitude is in Psalm 20, verses 6 to 8. Some trust in chariots, again, cutting edge battlefield technology in the day. Some trust in horses, big strong old things. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's why nobody came forward, because they've lost their grip on that. Isaiah's faithful attitude, even in the days of Judah's defeat and exile, is Isaiah writing this. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots, their battlefield technology, in the great strength of their horsemen, pride in the man. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord, because I'll kill you. Now. The problem is a problem of faith, and that's why they don't come out and fight it. And let's face it, evangelical Christians across Wales today sit in their nice little places. We can do it. Sit in where it's comfortable. It's a faith issue. And this nutty stands up in front of a big church on a Sunday evening and says, We're doing this, we're taking on, you know, we're going to you know, be in the White Hot on the Monday, we're going to be running the company again on Tuesday, and we're going to be doing some village on some Sunday. And we're going to do that. Faith issue. <laughs> I didn't have a good life, but I certainly had a six foot three block the other day right in a radio and me telling me I shouldn't be doing this, I thought I had a bloody cheek, you know. <laughs> but you know, it comes to you, you've got to just to take it, you know. Crack 
The people were destroyed in their spirit because they let go of their God and because their leader was utterly destroyed in spirit and did not lead them out as he ought to have done. The point of Saul was he was to lead his people out in battle. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So there's the problem. Once you know that, <clears throat> you know that they're unwilling to take risk. And you know that once they're unwilling to take risk in the Lord's name, by faith, contrast with David. David comes along, he says, verse 26, who is Goliath? Who is this guy? Who is this guy who's coming to you? Who is this who's taunting? <laughs> and then they were going, well, you know, if you wouldn't do that, the king's going to give you this, and he'll give you that, and he'll give you that, and the king's going to give you all that. And, and David says, what do you mean? What is going to be given to the person who does this? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that come out here taunting the God of Israel? Let me hear Never mind what the king's going to give. Is that, is that a motivation for us? This guy's taunting our God, and you're sitting there talking about, well, you know, he could have this off the, off the kid, and he could give you that. He could, that's not a sufficient motivation. The glory of God is at stake. Here we go. Completely different perspective. And Saul says, verse 33, you can't. Can't that? I just, I just love it in churches when, when people say, can't that? Really? Watch. Let's try it. And David's going, I can. And I will. You can't do that, says Saul. And David says, My God's got a history. When I was alone on a hilltop and there was flocks and there was bears and there was lions and it, you know, you've been to the zoo, I've been to the zoo, you've seen these things. You were telling me a story about Romania. And Doors with big nails struck right through them because the bears come. You know? The paw of the bear. Scary business. Then he goes, My God's got a history with bears and lions. And me and my slender mistake. You're not able to fight, to go out against this first son and fight him, says Saul, verse 33. You're only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. Saul just can't see beyond the material world. And it's making him horribly negative. And David says, verse 36, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he's defied the armies of the living God. It's a, it's a crucial issue, isn't it? The living God. Our God alive. The Christian God is alive. And David says, verse 37, The Lord will rescue me from the paw of the lion. And the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. <clears throat> so Saul says, Let's do this the human way, verses 38 and 9. I'll stick my armor on you. Give me that. Yeah. He's clanking around in this man. What a shameful disgrace it is when the people of God feel it necessary to go clanking around in Saul's armor. not accept the simple vulnerability of being there relying on their God. So grateful a few weeks ago John Piper was saying something on the internet somewhere about <clears throat> raising the question really about our churches and the way we do things, clanking around in Saul's armour I suppose you'd say. What are we doing as a church that wouldn't fall flat on its face if God didn't show up? David's putting his life on the line, God doesn't show up. So, that's faith. That's what faith actually is. Living like God is going to show up. Living like there is a living God. Living like you can rely on Him and you can trust Him because that's what you need to do. For Him to be glorified. Well, <clears throat> David's got the sense to deal with that. 
Lord Jesus God's way, he says, verses 39 and 40, I can't go in these. So he took them off. <laughs> took them off. He took his staff in his hand, he took five smooth stones from the stream, the one that was in the photo just there, and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, he went out to the Philistine. God very often does things in ways that humanly don't make sense, so that he can get the glory. Can we trust him for that? People are constantly working to improve the social acceptability of what the church does. To improve what we see as the visible possibilities of success. And David takes off the armour and refuses the shield and lays down the sword. The uncircumcised Philistine is going down. But when he does so, it is God's doing it. God is the one who's going to get the glory. Men of God are jealous of God's glory. So, okay, the contest of David and Goliath. Sorry, Caleb, it's only very brief. See, there's only a few verses for this. The details of the con the con the contest. Need more tea. The details of the contest itself are really terse, they're not relevant. This is what's going on in the background as well. It's all this trusting God with this stuff. Okay, Goliath comes out, he's full of words, he's full of contempt that the champion the Israelites have produced. De Goliath is full of contempt, David is full of faith. Not in his contemptible self, but in his God. First, there's Goliath's flesh-induced arrogance, the sort of arrogance and pride that comes before fall. And secondly, there's the way Goliath speaks as the champion of his pagan gods, cursing David by his gods. Goliath, the David, true. This isn't a mere fight between men, but a contest between true and false deities. Now, of course, David used his weapons, right? But his faith wasn't in his weapons, his faith was in the Lord his God. So first off, David has to get used to facing Goliath's disdain, get used to it. And secondly, David has to face Goliath's demonic assault on him. The Philistine cursed David by his gods. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This is laughable. This is madness. This is Sunday night. People looking at me think he's plotting. And I'll strike you down and cut off your head, says David. Get out of the way. We'll get the job done. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that I am a tremendous warrior. Is that right? That's what David said. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword, see this is what the armies of Israel have got wrong, it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, he'll give you all into our hands. There's the difference between David and Saul. Explicit, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, all these wise and wonderful technologies, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defy, as if naked. Confident, God honouring, no contest. Goliath never got near him. <laughs> he never got near him. One slingshot, one vulnerability in his armour. After six weeks of taking taunting, long, laborious battlefield posturing. Contest that is no contest is settled in seconds. What happens is here in the valley, that contest takes place, and the Philistines are pushed all the way back here to Gath and to Ekron. It's a huge victory. David Payne, Old Testament scholar, at his very first battle, therefore, David 
achieve more than Saul ever did. And he did it with sling and a rock. Now, <clears throat> do you know something about checking David's pedigree? Who is this man? A bit odd, because he's been playing the harp in Saul's court, remember? To soothe his spirits. This guy Saul has taken so little notice of the guy who's soothing him. He's not interested in him, he just wants what he can get from him. As an object, doesn't know anything about it. And he hasn't taken much care of the, who's going to be the guy who's going to have his daughter's hand in marriage either, has he? Saul has completely lost the plot. Conclusion. So here we are. Look at us. What a bunch of Davids in a little small room. We are not strong. See, my idea about you know, the sort of stuff we're engaged in, the sort of task we've got on here, the sort of thing we're trying to do, reaching this place and reaching places over there and over there and over there. Um, <clears throat> my idea about that is what you do is get a big church together, uh, get a big church somewhere nearby, and then send out the congregation, and you've got a lot of people then to do it, wouldn't you? Is that a better way to go about things? Do you think we should just wait until there's more of us? You know, I see churches with hundreds of people going along on a Sunday, and they say, well, we're just waiting until we're strong enough to be able to. <laughs> see, see David sitting in there and shaking his head. Oh, not again. <laughs> not again. It's not again. Where's your faith? Where's your trust in God? We're not strong, but we will be inhibited by that. See, one man in the whole host of Israel was ready to go out slaying giants in the name of his God. He was a boy. He was a boy who used to walk there. He was a boy more at home with the herds and the flocks. A boy, not a heavyweight, who put his trust in his God and defied poverty of resource and physical inability. He couldn't even wear a warrior's armour or wield a warrior's shield. That's a difficult sentence. That must have been written in the very early hours of the morning. He couldn't do that. But he had a history with his God where he learned to trust his God. And when the day of crisis came, he's the one who wasn't found lacking. When the challenge was there, and the challenge comes to us in all sorts of aspects of our lives, doesn't it? When we're up against the reality of our own personal weakness. David's already been learning to trust God when he's really got nothing to offer. And so now with everyone watching and the honour and the liberty, not just of his nation but of his God at stake, David knew not to arm himself. Tended strength. He knew not to try and pick up Saul's armour, nor seek to fight according to the conventions and practices of contemporary warfare. And everybody told him he couldn't do it. But he trusts in his God. And he does. And he's That's what's called faith in the Bible. And that is what God has required of us. May He find it, and may He have glory. Amen.